Okay, today I'd like to talk about the sun. Now, specifically, I'd like to delve into the sun a little bit. Uh, not literally, but um, at least um, talk about what happens inside the sun, how what happens to create the energy that the sun makes, and how it gets from there to here. So, uh, specifically, we'll talk a lot more about this as we go through here, but um, we're going to talk about the different layers of the sun's interior. We're going to talk about, uh, specifically, nuclear fusion inside the sun. Now, it sounds scary, but don't worry too much here. And, um, and then we're going to talk about how the sun transfers outwards from each layer and eventually uh, leaves the sun on its way here to Earth. So it's really cool stuff, and, and understanding exactly how the sun makes this energy really is the story of, of why we have life here on Earth, because we're completely reliant on the energy the sun makes. So uh, let's start off here. Just um, like I said, we'll go through each of the layers more in depth, but I just want to kind of give you an overview of what the interior structure looks like here. Now, going from the inside out, we start with the sun's core here at the very center. This is by far the hottest, densest, and most pressurized region within the sun. This is, it turns out, the, the perfect cauldron for nuclear fusion, which is how it makes its energy. Um, so some of the most, ex actually probably the most extreme conditions in the entire solar system are found here at the sun's core. Now, as we go outwards, we get to the radiative zone, the next layer out here, and turns out radiative zone um, and radiation or light are directly related. And, um, but as we go, and we'll see why that's important, but as we go further from the sun, further from the core, we're going to see that the temperature and the pressure will both drop. Now going outwards a little bit, the next layer we come to is the convective zone, and we see it's quite a bit cooler yet. And uh, there's this thing called convection, which we'll see what that is in a moment. And then finally, the very outermost layer, what we, what we would refer to as the surface, is what we call the photosphere. And this is where, when we look up at the sun, we take a photo of it. This is what we see, so hence photosphere. So um, let's look at, first of all, starting at the, very, at the very center, let's talk about how nuclear fusion works. Um, again, don't be worried about this. It, it, when we break it down, it's just a couple basic ideas here. Now, number one, uh, when we're talking about nuclear anything, what we're referring to specifically is the nucleus of an atom. Now, as you guys know, the, the nucleus of an atom the nucleus of an atom is just the centermost portion where if you have a normal looking atom, you have a nucleus and then it's surrounded by electrons. Those of you who have a chemistry, there's different shells, of electrons, blah, blah, blah. Um, but specifically when we talk about fusion, fusion means combining two small things and fusing them together to make a big one. So nuclear fusion is taking two nuclei, turning them into a bigger nucleus. And um, when, we, when we look in the sun, actually, what's happening within the sun, nuclear fusion is, is occurring because inside the sun, the, the atoms that we typically think of as like how matter is made, um, this is not what the inside of the sun looks like. Turns out inside the sun, it's so hot that, that literally the electrons just start to fly off in their own way. So inside the sun, the electrons are swimming around on their own. And that makes the, the nuclei, that, that frees up the nuclei. So the, we have individual nuclei floating around inside the sun, and they're not being protected by that typical cloud of electrons that are around them. And the reason why that's important is that once we remove the electrons that, that would otherwise protect that nucleus, once we remove those electrons, all of a sudden you can now start having nuclei banging together and doing their own thing. So when we talk about nuclear fusion, literally all we mean is we're taking nuclei from atoms, turn them into bigger nuclei. And I mean, it's as simple as that. I mean, it's not quite that simple, but um, just for the record too, when we talk about nuclear power here on Earth, we're actually referring to nuclear fission. And that's a different idea. That means you're taking a really big nucleus, typically uranium or plutonium, and you're splitting up into smaller nuclei. In both of these cases, nuclear fusion or nuclear fission, we release energy and that's, that's the whole point of it. Uh, but just make sure that you understand that nuclear fission is what we use on Earth, whereas nuclear fusion is what happens inside the sun. So specifically, when we want to get into what nuclei we're, are we combining, what nuclei are we making, this is the, the, the general overview of what's happening inside the sun. We're taking hydrogen, which the atomic symbol is H. Uh, don't worry about the one there means that your textbook describes it. But we're taking hydrogen or H, turning it into helium, H-E, and in the process it gives off energy. Now, the picture here, you'll see that actually it's not hydrogen, we're taking four protons. 
Um, but if you think about it, actually, hydrogen, the simplest element, a normal looking hydrogen atom has only one charge in the nucleus. So in other words, the nucleus of hydrogen atom literally is just a proton. And then it's surrounded by one electron going around it. So like I said, within the sun, the, the, um, the material is so hot that the electron gains so much energy, it just leaves. It, it's what's called ionizing the atom. But the, the electron is just, it, it's off doing its own thing. So when we talk about the nucleus of a, of a hydrogen atom, it literally is equivalent to a single proton. So the exact way that this happens, or, or kind of the somewhat more detailed way it happens, is we're taking four hydrogen nuclei, again, equivalent to protons. So we're combining four hydrogen nuclei to make a single helium nucleus. So this brings up a couple more questions now. Um, first of all, those of you who, um, well, actually, the, the maybe the most basic question, helium has two positive charges. Helium is atomic number two. Why don't we just take two protons, combine them together, and now we have just two protons. Why are we bothering with those other two there? Um, why don't we just take hydrogen and hydrogen and make a helium? Now, the reason for that, if you were to remove the neutrons from this nucleus here, turns out two protons stuck together are incredibly unstable and they want to split apart as soon as you make it. So if you try to make a helium atom without using neutrons, it won't last, it, it, it's, it's unstable, it, it will just split back up into the original things. So the whole purpose of these neutrons here is essentially to stabilize the nucleus and it allows this to be a, a stable, long-lived, um, long -lived, um, useful nucleus of, of helium. Now, the next thing you might recognize is over here, if you count up the charge, each proton has a charge of plus one. So we start with a charge of positive four. And pretty clearly, we end up with a charge of positive two. So what's going on here? Now, um, this requires a little bit more explanation. And, and for that, we can delve into the proton-proton chain, which is the specific step-by-step -step method. Um, and for what it's worth, for, for the sake of this class, I'm not going to ask you to, to memorize this or really understand much. Uh, long story short, though, I'll show up a slide in a second. Long story short, what ends up happening, two of these protons actually release their charge as uh, what's known as a positron or a positively charged electron. So one of these protons is going to spit out its charge. So a proton will turn into a positron that just leaves and it carries the charge away. And the result is it's neutrally charged, or a neutron. And that happens for two of these guys. So two of the protons turn into neutrons, and that's what allows us to create a stable, long-lived helium nucleus. So if you're curious, this is the proton-proton chain. Um, you can pause this and read through it. You might need to look up some vocabulary words. What is deuterium? There's um, uh, tritium, which is, uh, actually, no, there's not tritium. Um, um, helium-3, blah, blah, positrons, neutrinos. Um, this is above the scope of the class at, at this point here. So um, look at it at, our, at your own peril, if you will. Um, it's super interesting, and, and it's awesome that we actually understand exactly how this happens with, within the sun. But skip. Um, this is the overall reaction, though. You take four protons, turn it into this single helium nucleus. Now here are the positrons. Those are what carry the charge away. There's these guys called neutrinos. Here's these gamma rays. Again, though, this is the thing that, if you forget everything else in this video, you should know this. Four heliums create a, sorry, four hydrogens create a helium. So um, let's go a little bit further here, and let's, um, let's ask where this energy actually comes from. Now, um, this is one of the strangest aspects of this whole idea. If you, so remember, we start with four hydrogen nuclei, and it turns into a single helium. Turns out if you weigh, if you, if you look at the mass of the four hydrogen nuclei, if, if you put up on some tiny atomic scale or something, uh, turns out the hydrogen literally weighs more than the helium. So you start off with four single hydrogen nu nuclei, you turn them into hel a helium nucleus, and somehow the masses don't match up. Now, this would be the same thing as, say, um, if four people who weigh 150 pounds um, walk into a room together, if you were to weigh those four people initially, their, their combined weight would be 600 pounds, four times 150. However, so they weigh combined 600 when they, before they come into the room. Once they pass through that door, all of a sudden, they weigh a combined 
596 pounds, not 600. Somehow in the act of passing through that door destroys or, 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 or destroys four pounds or four pounds just completely disappear. Now it's not like one of them chops off their arm and leaves it outside or anything. Um, it, it's literally, you take the same exact thing at one point, you do something to it, all of a sudden the mass is just completely gone. Now in the case of uh, Inside the Sun, what happens is every second, 600 million tons of hydrogen undergo fusion, and what we get is 596 million tons of helium. So quite literally, the sun is losing 4 million tons of its mass per second. And I mean, that's kind of scary. It's like if every second you're losing a few ounces of your mass, I mean, you're only gonna live so long. Um, now, it turns out actually the sun has something like 10 to the 14 times more mass than this. So um, it, it basically, this it would take trillions and trillions of years for the sun to like destroy all of its mass by this. And by then, um, the, the sun will long have since exploded and it's gone. So yeah, it's true. The sun is very slowly losing its mass over time, but it's essentially negligible combined with its overall weight. But here's the thing though, where does this mass go? What happens? How is the sun able to literally just like destroy mass? Where, what's going on here? And this is a really important thing. Turns out that as it destroys the mass, that mass is actually converted to energy. This is one of the single most important ideas in actually all of physics. Mass can be turned into energy. You can destroy mass. You are allowed to destroy mass, but it's in this place, you need to replace it with energy. Now, this seems to violate everything that we were taught as kids, like matter can't be created or destroyed, the law of conservation of matter, that's all BS. It is not true. <laughs> so this, th this concept is what we call mass to energy conversion, or you might hear it known as mass energy equivalence. But what it means is mass can be destroyed, but it must be replaced by an equivalent amount of energy. So you can turn mass into energy, and you can actually go the backwards route too. You can turn energy, like pure energy, back into mass. Whose idea was this? What, where did this come from? Um, think for a second, uh, pause it, try to think about who said something about mass and energy being related. Turns out, Einstein. This was Einstein's E equals mc squared. And, and this is exactly what this equation deals with. Um, now in this equation, uh, just going through, you should understand the letters. I'm not going to ask you to solve questions for, for the sake of our class, but um, the E stands for the energy that's produced. The M stands for the mass that you destroyed to produce that energy. And then the C squared, C is just, whenever you see C in a scientific equation, it, it usually stands for the speed of light. And that's just a constant value. So C squared is just that speed squared. Uh, now, just to, to be a little bit careful here, if you actually do need to use uh, this formula for calculations, uh, the you absolutely have to express mass in kilograms. You can't use pounds. You can't use ounces. Um, and then the result you get out, if you use C in terms of um, the, the proper constant, uh, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, the answer you get out, the value of energy you get is expressed in joules, which is, for all practical purposes, the same as watts. So like a hundred watt light bulb means that it's producing a hundred joules of energy every second. So if you want to think of just replace joules with watts, that's fine. So um, let's go through and do an example of this here. Now um, let's, let's, I mean, this is kind of dumb, but let's say you're playing ping pong and you hit the ball so hard that the ball just disappears. You somehow destroy all of the mass of that ball while you hit it. Um, now it, there's no way you would ever be able to do this, but, but, in theory, if you somehow manage to do this, let's see how much energy you produce. So the first thing we need to look at what our variables are. So the mass, um, now I, I'm kind of, I'm rounding actually, I think the mass of ping pong ball is something like two and a half grams or something. Let's just say it's about a gram or like you destroy a third of the ping pong ball or something. So um, the mass here is one gram, but we need to express that in kilograms. So when you convert one gram to kilograms, a gram is just a thousandth of a kilogram or 10 to the minus three kilograms is the easiest way to say it. Now the speed of light, this, will, this is always a constant. So speed of light is, this is 300 million meters per second. Now that means that C squared is nine times 10 to the 16. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop with the units here. Um, those of you who've had a physics class, 
you can fill them in. But let's see how we can figure out how much energy is released. So the energy, you just multiply that number by that number. 10 to the minus 3 times that. What we get out is very shy of just under 10 to the 14 joules. So 9 times 10 to the 13 joules. This is something insane. This is a hundred million million joules. It would be equivalent to a hundred mega megawatt nuclear power plant if, if you could create such a thing, which you can't, um, for what it's worth. This is quite literally more than 10 times as much energy as the whole rest of the Earth creates. If you add up all of the nuclear power plants, all of the, the coal plants, all of the wind turbines, all of the um, gas that's burned by cars, all the solar panels, any other form of energy that you can think of, this is 10 times more energy than everything else produces combined. So you see, and this literally just comes from a single tiny little ping pong ball. So you see how powerful this is. This is the single most efficient way to create energy. And uh, this is what, what drives every star, not just the, the sun, but every star out there is constantly destroying a little of its mass at a time to produce the energy that, that lights it up. So this mass to energy conversion is what allows the sun to glow. And it's, it's that important in science. So, okay, let's talk about once we create that energy, what happens to it and how do we actually end up um, seeing that energy was created at the heart of the sun? So we're going to go through layer by layer from the core outwards until we hit the photosphere or the, or the surface and see what happens to the energy that's created. So when we look at the core, um, as we've just talked about here, the core is constantly producing energy by nuclear fusion. Now here's a reaction. This is how we usually write it in science. Four hydrogen yields a helium and energy. And as we discussed, that energy comes from destroying some of the mass via mass to energy conversion. And then now the one piece of the puzzle that was shown in that diagram, um, but the energy specifically, when it releases the energy, it's released in the form of the highest energetic type of light that we know, which is gamma rays. So every time uh, you take four hydrogens turned into one helium, two gamma rays are released. Now, what happens to those gamma rays? When we go to the next, uh, the next layer here, the radiative zone, the, the gamma rays that are pouring out of the core, are they're just photons. They're very high energy photons. So what happens is the photons are passed from particle to particle to particle to particle in just completely random directions throughout the sun. And this is known in science what we call the random walk, um, or you kind of hilariously hear it called the drunken walk. Like if just some drunk dude was walking from like block to block, had no idea where he was going, he's going to get somewhere, but not in a very efficient way. And that's, this is essentially what happens with the photons. They're randomly passed from one nucleus to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. Now over time, they're eventually going to accidentally make their way out. Not really on purpose, but that's just what happens. Um, but what happens along the way, as they, as they go from the core, which is 15 plus million Kelvin, outwards through the radiative zone, as the temperature cools, the photons will slowly lose, I mean, they're not losing their energy, but they're, they're going from a fewer number of high energy photons to a greater number of lower energy photons. And the further out we go from the core and the cooler it gets, the more and more we're gonna see lesser energy photons. So essentially the gamma rays slowly evolve into X-rays and those may even turn into UV photons further out. And um, the, the whole crazy thing about this is that that random walk or the, the, the drunken photons walking around through the, through the radio zone, um, literally it takes over 100,000 years to pass that energy through the radiative zone until it hits that next layer. So think about it. Every little bit of energy that you see from the sun's surface was created over 100,000 years ago, and it takes that long for the energy to slowly seep out to the surface. Um, oh, I somehow turned the page at some point. I don't know how long ago that happened. Anyway, um, so the next layer, the convective zone. Once those photons finally reach this layer, now what happens is the gas becomes um, low enough in density and pressure that finally you can, the, the energy starts to flow faster. And specifically what happens is the energy that's coming up through the radiative zone heats up the bottom of this layer here. And then that causes the gas to, to begin rising because hot gas rises. That's true on the earth, it's true in the sun. So as, as the photons heat up the bottom layer of the zone, 
the gas, we start to develop these jets of hot gas rising up to the surface. And then what happens, I'm going to uh, flip to the next page here. What happens as we have these high energy jets rising up to the surface, once the, the gas carries that energy to the surface, then that's when it's finally released as light. So these, the, the gas loses its energy and it cools off. And then we know that cool gas wants to sink down. But the problem is that there's this jet underneath that's pushing it back up. So what, what ends up happening is that the, the hot gas rises and then it releases the energy and it gets shoved to the side. So I guess for you, it gets shoved to the side or it gets shoved to the side here. And so the jets are coming up, they get pushed to the side and that cooler gas now sinks back down in kind of this anti-jet here. And then now it absorbs more energy from the radio zone. It heats up, rises, uh, releases energy, cools off, sinks. This is exactly what we call a convection cell. And we see these actually within Earth's mantle. We also see these within the sun's convective zone. So that's what we call convection, hot gas rising, cool gas sinking. Now, the cool thing is once we form these convection cells, we can actually see these effects on the surface. And this is what we call solar granulation. So this is an extreme close-up of the sun's surface. And this, this actually is what the sun's surface looks like when we zoom in. And we see, we can distinctly see the tops of these jets. The tops of these jets are the, especially the really bright areas or even the yellowish areas here. Now the jets aren't all like perfectly circular like we have here, but we see that there's very distinct hotter patches that, that are brighter. And then the darker patches, the black kind of boundaries are where it's cooled off and it's now sinking down. And this is amazing when we, when we look up close, this actually is what the sun looks like here. And we're seeing this flow of energy up and then back down below the sun. Now, if you look over time, the, the really cool thing is we can actually see time lapses of this happening. So um, this video that I'm going to show here is over the span of about two hours. So, I mean, obviously it's sped up, but not like extremely sped up. And just watch what the sun's surface looks like. So it's not constant. It's not this like perfect uniform sphere. It's actually this, it, I mean, this looks, the closest thing you describe this as is like a pot of boiling water, except boiling in kind of slow motion. But we see it's constantly changing. These granules are constantly moving, the, the hot jets rising, let's play it again. The hot jets rising are constantly evolving. And this is what happens to the sun over the course of literally just two hours. So I, I think it's incredible that we can actually see this here. So um, the, through the convective zone, the hot gas is rising, and that's what carries the energy up there. And finally, once that energy hits the surface, that's when the energy is finally released as light. And that's what we see. Now, it turns out that the sun's surface is, um, it, it happens to be at about 6,000 Kelvin, and it behaves as a black body or, or just basically a, an object that emits light due only to its heat. So it has this excess of heat, it wants to get rid of it, and it does so in the form of light. And any object, when you heat it up to about 6,000 Kelvin, it naturally wants to produce almost entirely visible light. And so the sun takes this energy and it gives it off as light. Now the peak wavelength of that light, or, or the average wavelength, falls smack dab in the middle of the visible spectrum. And that's why the sun, why we can see the sun. Um, and once that light is released, and by the way, it also releases a little bit of UV. That's what gives you um, sunburns. It releases some infrared light, and most of that is blocked by um, the greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. And so, the, the, again, the majority of the light it makes, the visible light, is what we actually see here on Earth's surface. Uh, and when it releases that light, at, the light travels, obviously, at the speed of light until it hits Earth. And that takes about eight minutes. So the light that we're seeing was made 100,000 years ago and it takes 100,000 years and then only eight more minutes um, once it hits the surface to reach us. So pretty fantastic. So um, <laughs> the sun isn't just this nice smiling like ball of fire. It turns out, yeah, there's a lot more going on here. And um, I hope this makes sense. Thanks.